All right, well, it's seven o'clock. We have a couple of people on. Do you guys want to start? Sure. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time to um, attend this webinar on um, taking control of your epilepsy. My name is Alyssa. I work in the Department of Neurosurgery at Mount Sinai, and along with um, our partners at Monteris, worked to um, put together this webinar. So thank you again for coming out tonight. Um, we have the privilege of hearing tonight from Dr. Anuradha Singh, who is an epileptologist at the Mount Sinai Hospital, as well as Dr. Uh, Fedor Ted Panoff, um, who is a neurosurgeon in the Mount Sinai Health System, um, operating primarily out of Mount Sinai West. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Singh to um, start the presentation. Thanks, Alyssa. You know, thank you for everything that you do. It, it takes a lot of effort to organize such webinars. So, and there are a lot of people behind the scenes who make this possible. And thank you to our audience who has joined us. Um, so I'll, can you advance the slides, Alyssa? All right, so we're gonna talk about, um, uh, briefly about what is drug-resistant epilepsy? What are the different treatment options we have for epilepsy? And uh, if you can go to one slide back, Alyssa. Uh, what are the different options we have? And then we are gonna hear from one of our very dear patients about his personal experience about epilepsy. And then Dr. Panov is gonna talk about some of the very uh, least invasive surgical options that we have to debunk any myths about uh, surgical safety or um, you know, the very positive outcomes of surgery. And then we will leave some room to uh, answer your questions. Um, so let's start. So I'll give you an overview and we'll start with that. How, how do I define a seizure? So a seizure is any change in the clinical state of the patient, uh, which can, be of, have, can have different manifestations, uh, which is as a result of too much of firing of the neurons, which are the building blocks of the nervous system. And the seizures can be provoked or they can be unprovoked. Provoked means that something triggered the seizure, whether it's sleep deprivation, alcohol provocation, some kind of a drug intoxication, or if there are no provoking factors, then they are called unprovoked seizures. And sometimes people ask me that, you know, I had seizure, but I don't have epilepsy. So there is a very fine distinction between what we call seizure and what we call epilepsy. So if you have more than two seizures, which are 24 hours apart, and they are unprovoked, then you have epilepsy. On the other hand, if you have a seizure, but your EEG is abnormal or your MRI is abnormal, then patients do not, or doctors do not want to wait for a second seizure to happen and you get started on different medications so that you never suffer a seizure again. So um, epilepsy is a recurrent condition where you have a tendency to have recurrent seizures again, and somebody has more than two seizures, the chances that they will have a third or a fourth becomes higher, especially if the test results are abnormal and can be as high as 80 to 70 to 90 percent. So what are the common causes of seizures? As I said, sometimes it can be just some kind of a metabolic change in your body. But then there are other risk factors for epilepsy. Somebody born with some chromosomal or genetic abnormality. Somebody who has started having seizures during infancy when they had seizures with just high fever and then their seizures stopped after you know, a few febrile seizures. But then later on in adulthood, they started having what we call now a relapse of seizures uh, or adult onset epilepsy. Sometimes there are you know, malformations of the brain. Um, like sometimes there is a little scar tissue that is there because you had history of say seizures with high fever, or sometimes there was some kind of a, the way the brain was laid down was not perfect. And there were some kind of a malformations of the brain. Um, there can be associated head trauma with loss of consciousness, especially if there was some kind of a blood collection in the brain that predisposes you to what we call post-traumatic seizure disorder or epilepsy. And then there are different kinds of growths in the brain, which we call tumors, which can be very benign or they can be very 
malignant, and sometimes it's harder to treat certain even low-grade tumors. And there are other conditions where you just have some abnormal blood vessels, um, and that causes intractable epilepsy. So what do we do when we have epilepsy? When patients are diagnosed with epilepsy, we take a very good, next slide please, Alyssa. We take a very good medical history. So we ask the patient, what, did you, what do you feel before you have a seizure? That helps us distinguish which part of the brain their seizures are starting from. We do a good neurological examination to see if there are any abnormal neurological findings that we find on examination. And then we do a very good quality, high resolution, good imaging of the brain to pinpoint the cause if we find any structural abnormality in the brain, which can explain why a patient had a seizure. We also measure the electrical activity of the brain, which is called electroencephalogram or EEG, and there are different ways of doing EEG. You can just have a snapshot EEG in a lab, in an outpatient lab, or you can have longer EEGs at home or in the hospital. And I will go over some of the um, scenarios where we like doing home EEGs or versus um, in hospital EEGs. When we take a medical history and we do, you know, try to figure it out, what does the MRI show? What does the EEG show? We in our mind are trying to figure it out whether this patient has what we call focal epilepsy or generalized epilepsy. In generalized epilepsy, patients typically do not feel any aura because seizures start suddenly from both sides of the brain. So they don't even get any time to, um, call their family or friends for help, and they go into a certain kind of uh, convulsion. And there are different types of focal types of seizures and generalized seizures. On the other hand, focal starts um, from a part of the brain and it may spread very slowly or it may spread very suddenly. And usually patients experience an aura, but sometimes they don't because they spread very rapidly to both sides of the brain. It is believed that generalized epilepsies, they, are, they tend to occur at a younger age and they are not that drug resistant. So if you use a drug, they, they respond to the drug management. Very small percentage of generalized epilepsies have uh, patients with ep generalized epilepsy have drug resistance. On the other hand, the focal seizures, we encounter more problems, what we call drug resistant epilepsy. Next slide, Alyssa. So it, it's not that, it's a very common condition. It's the fourth most common neurological disorder. There are about 70 million people worldwide who are living with epilepsy. Just in the US alone, about 3.4 to 3.5 million people have epilepsy. About 150,000 new cases of epilepsy, they diagnose, they get diagnosed every year. Now, out of these, the first choice that we typically resort to, next slide, please is what we call anti-seizure medications. So these are the medicines that your doctor will prescribe to you. And they are the first line of therapy. And in about one third of the cases, um, patients continue to have seizures no matter what combination of medications you put them on. So different medications are used for different kinds of epilepsy. And that's why I was telling you that it is important to make that distinction, whether somebody has focal epilepsy or generalized epilepsy, because you tend to pick up different medications for different choices. And the test results like MRI and EEG help you distinguish that the history helps you distinguish between the two types. Now, over the years, there have been several new anti-seizure medications that have come out. We have about 25 plus medicines that we use, but medications come with a side effect. These go through the central nervous system and patients some complain of drowsiness, dizziness, confusion. There are weight gain and weight losing properties of different medications, but these have behavioral and psychiatric uh, complications too. We need to do the regular monitoring of the blood test to make sure that they do not cause any impairment of the functioning of the 
different kinds of cell lines that are important. So patients have to go through the levels of the medications, the uh, different routine labs, making sure that their liver function is okay, their kidney functions are okay. And there are medications which are primarily metabolized through the liver or through the kidney. And we make a very um, good distinction about that. What are the other comorbid condition our patient has and can we use men one medication which can help this patient with the epilepsy or with other comorbid conditions? And I'll name a few, like epilepsy and migraines are very common. Epilepsy, depression, and anxiety is very common. So we try to pick up drugs which are more have more mood stabilizing properties. And there are genetic differences between patients. So there are patients who are very sensitive to medications. And even if you give them the, the tiniest doses of the medicine, they don't tolerate it. And then our hands are tied that this patient is sensitive. They are having seizures. What else can we offer them? Next slide, please. So when seizures don't stop, what do we do? So as I said, when I start a new medication, I have a good feeling that about 47 to 50% of the patients will respond very well and they will not have seizures. But then if I have to pick up a second medication, in addition to the first medication, the chances that I would be successful drops down to 14%. And if I have you know, picked up an appropriate medication, I have dosed them properly, I'm not using homeopathic doses of the medicine, and I have picked up the right choice for that right kind of epilepsy, the chances that a third medicine or a combination of 25th medicine that will work drops down to just 4%. So remember that number. And that could be because of several factors. So next slide. It could be because, you know, patient has a brain tumor of a certain kind or patient has a genetic mutation of a certain kind or uh, drugs, drugs are being given, but they are not penetrating the brain with the concentration or not reaching the target where they should reach um, at the right concentration. So there are a host of other things. There are sometimes diseases where there is inflammation or infection in the brain where the anti, the traditional anti-seizure medicines, they don't even work. And you know, you have to treat them with a different kind of approach. Um, as I mentioned before, that um, there are times when people have these kind of a transporter defect where there is a race between the drug is trying to get in, but then these transporters are just throwing it out. And that's one of the reasons that we have not concurred over brain tumors, um, despite all kinds of chemotherapies that come out every year. Next slide. So when medication don't work, you know, there are several uh, consequences of ongoing seizures. Um, and, uh, you know, there are neurologists who feel that, okay, I started um, patient on one medication. They used to have four to five convulsive seizures. Uh, you know, every month. Now they have only one convulsive seizure every month, but that one convulsive seizure can have a major consequence on the patient's memory, on cognition. There are risk of injuries. I have seen all kinds of burn injuries, drowning accidents, motor vehicle accidents, uh, you name it. You know, patients using some kind of a sharp object in a kitchen and had injuries of, you know, amputated their own limb during a state of confusion. And there are intellectual and learning issues, which is definitely very multifactorial. Sometimes it is because of the ongoing seizures that your brain, which is important for learning, is, is not able to comprehend or memorize the things that it could have without the epilepsy. Patients settle down with lower paying jobs Patients are unable to drive. Patients have emotional and other behavioral problems. Patients go into depression and anxiety. And if you don't address that depression, that makes your epilepsy worse. So there is a bi-directional kind of a relationship. As I mentioned before, there are side effects of medications. 
And if your seizures are not controlled with one medication or two, and you're taking three medicine at the highest dose, because you're still struggling with seizures, the drug interactions and the side effects of the three medicine on the liver and kidney also takes a toll. There are psychiatric side effects of the medications themselves. There are medications which decrease your cognition. So it is multifactorial. It's not only that your epilepsy is affecting your cognition, the side of effects of the medication can also affect the cognition problem. But then there is one risk and one other thing that we don't talk about because it's a very tragic and kind of a, a catastrophic entity, which is called sudden unexpected death in epilepsy called SUDA, which is a rare condition, but it can happen in patients, in adult patients, one in 1,000 per year. It's more common in male patients. It's more common in patients who have nighttime seizures but the risk of SUDEP is also seen in children, little less common, one in 4,500. And it is more common with convulsive seizures than other seizures. And then, you know, that patient education is important because I think that has to be brought up with patients who are not doing well, who continue to have seizures. And it just tends to occur after a grand mal seizure, you know, they were fine while they were eating dinner uh, with their family, and the next night they were found dead. And um, usually patients who have more multiple seizure medications and who are continuing, uh, continue to have seizures are at a high risk of sudden and unexplained death. Um, next slide. So the bottom line is when should surgery be considered? So if somebody has tried two or more anti-seizure medicine and are yet having seizures, if your seizures are socially disabling and affecting your day-to-day -day life, and it has a direct impact on your quality of life, whether you have, you're too sensitive to the medication side effects, difficulty tolerating the side effects of the medicine. And as I said, the drug-resistant epilepsy, if you uh, the chances that you will respond to some other combination is really, really low. Not everybody who has drug-resistant epilepsy is a good surgical candidate, but there are a lot of patients out there who do not understand that they don't have to live with seizures and they should do everything under the sun to make sure that they don't suffer from seizures if possible. And MRI, if it shows some abnormality in the area of the brain um, where seizures are known to start, you don't have to live with the medication side effects for the rest of your life and not consider taking out that abnormality from by resection or by some other means, which Dr. Banov is going to discuss in details. And when you think that you can safely take out that focus without causing any operative deficit. And we do a lot of tests to make sure that we try to cure epilepsy without causing any damage to the brain. That is our goal when we think about surgery. And when you're at an increased risk of injury and your seizure duration is excessively long and you're at a risk for either you know, cognition, memory problems, or struggling with the side effects, or you are at a high risk to have sudden unexpected death and epilepsy. Next slide. So um, again, this is kind of a repetition. Besides the EEG, MRI, and a medical history, we do advanced imaging. We try to find out what part of the brain your language comes from. We try to find out how is your memory supported by each hemisphere. So brain has two sides, right and left. And we try to individually check. We all have different strengths, right? We have we are good in navigating sometimes and we are good in remembering numbers of the or the names of the people. So we try to find out that how is your memory that in case we have to do some kind of a resective surgery means take out the focus, will the patient be able to have normal memory after the operation? And we do a detailed memory testing called neuropsychological testing. Um, to check the memory, we screen you for depression and anxiety. 
We also do some advanced imaging of the brain to find out whether we can pinpoint that sweet spot in your brain, which is causing majority of your seizures. So it's really a multidisciplinary approach where you sit down with the neuroradiologist, neurosurgeons, the team of neurologists who are specialized in epilepsy called epileptologist, along with the neuropsychologist and a team of social workers and other people together. And we discuss your case in details from the history to capturing your seizures. And we'll talk about it in, a, in the next slide, I guess. It's, um, it's called what we call video EEG, where you bring in and we capture seizures. Alyssa, next slide. All right, so I'll just briefly mention before I give the, <laughs> um, before I give it to you, Dr. Pana. So what we do is what we call a video EEG and we do it for drug resistant epilepsy. We bring those patients to an epilepsy monitoring unit, EMU. Some of you who have joined us today must have undergone that test. We try to capture your seizures, see what do you do during your seizures. Are your seizures stereotyped or are they different types? If they are stereotyped, we believe that it is coming from one focus instead of multiple foci. But we don't wanna just think that we believe, we confirm it, we prove it, we see it. We capture your seizure where the video captures whatever changes happen when you are into a seizure and we monitor your EEG activity, see exactly which part of the brain it is coming from, which helps us figure it out. Is it coming from right or the left? With that, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Pana, who is going to discuss what are the different invasive or least invasive options we have to educate you about, you know, how different kinds of surgeries have really changed the way I look at drug-resistant epilepsy these days. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. And uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We know it's always difficult to make the time and we really appreciate this. The best way that we can fight seizures and get these uh, symptoms under control is uh, to share the information, to get the information out there and to get us all together talking about these things. Um, so let's, let's do the next slide. We'll talk about the treatment options that you will have potentially um, once a comprehensive team says, listen, the epilepsy really is medically refractory, it's drug resistant, what can we do? So the simplest way is to split it up into several options. The classic option that has been around now for uh, honestly close to 100 years is the invasive resective surgery, the open resection. It has gotten much better over the last few decades uh, with the improvements in imaging, with the improvements in neuropsychological evaluation, with us understanding the strength in the team. And as Dr. Singh said, having neuropsych work together with radiology, neurology, neurosurgery, and social work, we were able to devise a surgery that again, has the least possible complications and the greatest potential chance of seizure freedom. We'll leave invasive surgery a little bit off to the side. That would be something that people call craniotomy, temporal lobectomy, and we'll move on to the next topic, which is neuromodulation. Neuromodulation is usually reserved for a situation where the seizure is coming from an area of the brain that is critical to you as a patient, to you as a human being, to your family. It allows you to remember things or to move your right hand or to sense your left foot. In those cases, most certainly the team would never suggest uh, a resective or an ablated method for treatment. But what we're able to do, and the advances in the scientific field over the past 20 years, allow us to modulate that brain area. It will continue to function as it normally does, yet if a seizure starts in that area, it's possible to interrupt it before it spreads to the point of having you lose consciousness or having you hurt yourself. The minimally invasive surgeries have been also uh, on the front runner of, of what we've been trying to develop in neurosurgery. And one of the main options we'll discuss today is laser ablation. And uh, the wonderful patient that we have at the end, uh, Matthew will talk about his experience with this specific method. 
this is a combination um, of treatments uh, and these treatments have come through and have been designed uh, by the efforts of many, many scientists and doctors. Initially, some of the methods were used uh, to treat uh, tumors. And then we were able to leverage the fact that in an MRI scanner, we we're able to visualize specifically the temperature changes inside of every single millimeter of the brain. And that really made laser ablation in areas of the brain possible. Next slide. Most certainly all of these discussions need to be done together with your treatment physicians and together as a team. The different uh, scenarios will have different potential outcomes, different percentages. Chances of seizure freedom in one may be a little bit greater, but the risk may be a little bit greater. And uh, once you have this cogent conversation with the physician that's treating you, and uh, once you know, you're being treated potentially at a comprehensive epilepsy center, I think these options will become more and more clear. And that's the best way for us to make a decision as a team with you, the patient, and us, the team that's trying to take care of it. Next slide. So let's delve a little bit more into this minimally invasive laser ablation option. The way that the procedure is standardly done is we know that there's an area of the brain that is doing you no good, that is causing these electrical storms we call seizures. And historically, we've been trying to come up with the best way possible to deactivate that area, to keep the brain functioning as is, and to stop the seizures from spreading. This is now mostly done with a robotically assisted procedure uh, and it delivers laser energy through a tiny little incision, about 2.4 millimeters or the width of a lead of a pencil to a specific location that Dr. Singh and her team have agreed upon as the cause of the seizures. One of the more common areas we do this in is called the mesial temporal lobe. And uh, the wonderful thing that we brought up already about the human brain is it has two sides. And if one of the sides is being continuously beaten up by the seizures, usually the other side takes over. Means that a laser ablation in a well-selected patient is a safe procedure. The small opening in the skull, as we said, is, um, is uh, something that will be then closed up by only one stitch uh, and it is not noticeable cosmetically. The entire procedure is performed inside of the MRI machine itself, which is a very strong magnet. And we need to make sure that the patient and family is aware of that. And there's no contraindications of getting the MRI. The laser itself will be guided through the tiny opening using what we call neuro navigation. And at every second along the way, we're double checking to make sure that the trajectory of the laser probe is heading to the correct spot. Once the laser is at that spot, we turn it on and we monitor the temperature in the brain. And anytime the temperature in the brain increases in an area that's not intended, we turn the laser off. And thankfully that is like pulling your hand out of hot water before um, burning your hand. It takes, uh, it takes a few seconds to a minute to any area of the brain to become deactivated when the laser is firing and when the laser is causing the ablation, which means that this is again, an incredibly safe procedure from the perspective, uh, from the perspective of only ablating and deactivating the seizure focus itself. The hospital stay is getting shorter and shorter and usually these patients will go home the next day. Next slide. The potential candidates for the procedure are patients who have a clearly delineated area of the brain where the seizures originate. The focus of the seizures has to be uh, small enough so that the ablation would work. And usually that's in the scope of a couple of centimeters. The seizures must not be well controlled with medications. Again, as of right now, the indication for this procedure is the patient is not well controlled. If a medication takes care of your seizures and you can tolerate it, that probably is the right way to go. And these are also patients who would benefit from not getting a large surgery. Let's say there are other comorbidities, diabetes or heart disease something that makes a bigger procedure uh, a little bit more complex and difficult to tolerate. The benefits of the procedure are over 50% of seizure freedom. And we're getting better and better at these percentage numbers. The quality of life and the social function of a patient who controls their epilepsy significantly increases. And that's the one thing that we're really harp on, getting control of your life. 
bringing some predictability to your world and being able to move on with the things that you want to do. We used to have to shave uh, the entire head for some of these procedures and we no longer have to do so. So everyone gets to keep their hair and the scarring for the procedure is very small. As we said, the critical care stay is at this point almost unheard of. Most of these patients will spend one night with us and go home the next day. And the post-procedure pain is uh, much less than what it used to be 20 or 30 years ago. But as we said, the risks and limitations, as you see here, you have to be able to undergo an MRI to be able to go through this procedure. And there is a chance of swelling or a small chance of uh, blood loss, pulling of the blood. Uh, and headache, neurological issues, visual impairment, and some risk to memory is possible, depending on the site of the laser ablation itself. Next slide. Responsive neuromodulation, again, if we want to kind of take zoom out a little bit and say, well, now we're dealing with an area of the brain that the patient needs to keep. This device will be implanted and we'll be able to listen to that area of the brain without changing its function and wait for a seizure to start. Responsive neuromodulation is not a seizure cure because it does need for a seizure to start happening before it's able to treat them. We'll say that with a caveat that the brain does seem to work together with this device and year by year, the results of responsive neuromodulation do get better. But it's an unfortunate fact that we have to continuously work together with these patients to get them better. It's not a simple and it's not a quick solution. In this case, what we usually do is we remove a portion of uh, the cranium, the skull, and we create an area for this titanium plate cradle to sit in. And then the little microchip gets placed into there and it gets placed under the skin. So from the surface, uh, it's not visible. And usually the cosmetic result of that is good. And then small, tiny wires with contacts on them get threaded to the correct areas of the brain where they can listen for initiation of the seizure. Once the seizure is happening, the device will be able to send a small stimulus the other way and to short circuit the seizure from spreading. So you can think of it as pouring a glass of water on a match instead of waiting for that match to spread into a forest fire, at which point it's much harder to control. There's some expected scarring because this is a bigger opening for us to be able to get the microchip implanted. Um, and the hospital stay is still about one to two days. There's some headaches after the procedure uh, and usually those are well tolerated. And the patient is given a remote monitor system to take home and use with them, as well as a continuation of the anti-seizure medication. Next slide. So quick review of when to consider responsive neuromodulation. Again, the area of the brain should be well-defined. The seizures should not be controllable with medication. And you have to be over 18 years old as of right now for this procedure. Significant seizure reduction, it happens in about two-thirds of the patients, and at nine years, at three-fourths of the patients. Now, again, I want to stress the fact that this is not quite a seizure freedom, but it's a way to control your seizures better. On average, the neuropsychological profile from these procedures is good, and there does not seem to be an adverse effect on mood and no significant stimulation-related side effects from that little countercurrent that we discussed that stops the seizure from spreading. And if the device does not work, it can be explanted and it can be turned off. It's unfortunate, but that does happen. But the key here is that nothing about your brain is different with the implantation of this device. The risks, as we stressed, it does not fully eliminate seizures. There could be some pain at the site of the implant. And there's a small but real risk of infection, bleeding, and neurological impairment. The potential problems with the device can cause it to need to be explanted or changed. And the majority of these patients will stay on at least some of their seizure medications. Uh, the replacement of the batteries has gotten a little bit better as the community is working on making these last longer. And right now it'll be anywhere from two to eight years. Next slide. Deep brain stimulation is another version of neuromodulation. And that comes to us from the world of movement disorders. You may have heard of this for disorders like Parkinson's or dystonia or essential tremor. Here, the, the wires are placed inside of the brain, but the programming device gets placed underneath your collarbone in your chest. And here, the setup is that the device will continuously uh, stimulate the brain in certain areas to increase the defense of your own body against the seizures. 
Again, it does not cure epilepsy, but it can decrease the number and the severity of the seizures. As we discussed, the incisions are made in the head and also in the upper chest or the abdomen. The wires are placed into the brain and then passed under the skin to connect to the microchip itself. There's a short hospital stay and the patients are also given a smartphone-like device to be able to adjust their own stimulation as needed under the guidance of a physician. And it may also take several months before this really gives you the full benefit of the possibilities of the device. Regular follow-up in these cases is critical. Next slide. You should consider deep brain stimulation if you do have an area of the brain that has been decided by the team that is causing you the seizures. And again, the seizures should not be controlled by medication. If your seizures are controlled by medication, you're doing well. As long as you can tolerate the meds, sticking with that is probably the best way to go forward. As of right now, these devices are only approved in patients who are 18 and older. And at one year, about four out of 10 people will have less seizures, but that improves that at five years, about two thirds of the patients will experience reduced seizures. This again can positively impact your quality of life. Decreasing seizures is important. Decreasing the severity of the seizures is very important. The risks and limitation include again, the fact that this does not truly eliminate the seizures, just helps the brain fight them. And these are usually used with seizure medication. The rest of the risks are close to the risks of the responsive neuromodulation device. And some of these generators are now also rechargeable, which gives you potentially longer battery life anywhere from 10 to 15 years. Next slide. Another option that we need to cover for sure is called vagal nerve stimulation. Vagus nerve is a big nerve that goes from the brain to many different organs in your body and passes close to the skin in your neck. Um, over the last 30 years or so, it's been found out that if you're able to stimulate that nerve every five minutes or so, it also is able to create an extra defense for your brain against the seizures. It works well in some, it doesn't work well in some patients. We usually say about a third will have great benefit, about a third will have some benefit, and about a third, unfortunately, will not get benefit from this device. Again, vagal nerve stimulation does not cure epilepsy, but can be used together with medita medications to prevent or reduce seizures. And there are two small incisions that are made here. One is made just next to the Adam apple, in the neck, and the other one is made under the collarbone. The small wire is carefully wrapped around the vagus nerve in the neck, and that happens fairly deep, and this happens with the patient asleep. And then the implant of the microchip drive of it, the generator goes again underneath the collarbone. Typically, you come into the hospital and are able to leave the same day, but there would be some scarring from the procedure. And the patients are given a little magnet to swipe over the device if they feel that a seizure is coming on and that triggers the device. Otherwise, the device will fire about every five minutes for 30 seconds. Next slide. You should consider this in situations where the area where the seizures begin is clearly defined, but it does also work in situations where someone has something like generalized epilepsy or difficult to really pin down epilepsy. The seizures, again, are not well controlled by medications. That's the case to potentially ask your physician about the vagal nerve stimulation. You have to be over four years old uh, to be able to receive this specific implantation. Mean seizure reduction at one year was about 50%. And many patients, again, will improve more with time. And uh, three out of four people will report improvement in the quality of life. As other neuromodulatory devices, this one can be removed if we see that it is not functioning appropriately. Again, it has to happen in certain cases once we've realized that it's been too long and it's just not happening. The risks and the limitations do include, again, the fact that this does not eliminate or cure seizures. And it may take one to two years before you truly know how much it is helping you or your loved one. It's almost always will be used with seizure medication. And there are possible side effects like pain in the area of the incision or the throat, cough and hoarse voice when the stimulation is happening. There is potential that the device has to be explanted if uh, the hardware itself fails or re-implanted. The battery life expectancy for this device is anywhere from six to 11 years and would need a generator replacement once the battery dies. Next slide. 
So to finish up our whirlwind tour of possible surgical interventions to help your epilepsy, we will discuss open resection as well. Now this involves finding out which part of the brain is causing the seizures, making sure that it is easily reachable without having to go through any part of the brain that is eloquent that you need. And once that has been determined by the team, we can make a small incision with you asleep, uh, but we do have to shave some hair to be able to make the incision itself. Uh, take off for a time the piece of the bone that protects that part of the brain, replacing it later, and carefully excise the area that causes the seizures themselves. The brain tissue that is resected usually is sent for analysis, and we're able to give you a better diagnosis if the seizure was caused by a slow growing tumor or by uh, what we would call a birthmark of the brain a small malformation of the brain that a patient may have had since they were a little kid. The bone then is placed back on and fastened to the skull with small titanium screws and plates, and the skin is reclosed, and the incision usually feels very nicely. The hospital stay for this is about three to four days, and the pain is more significant than the other uh, neurosurgical interventions that we've described. Uh, at this time, though, this does give you the greatest chance at seizure freedom. Next slide. So let's talk about the candidates for open resection. For this one, we have to know where in the brain this is coming from to be able to talk to you and to your family about a possible resection. And your seizures uh, are not controlled with seizure medications. The latest trials are showing that approximately 70% will do well and will be seizure-free at one year. There is improvement in quality of life and social function. There is some potential decrease in neuropsychological outcomes with resective surgery, but that usually is made up for by the fact that the seizures stop and the rest of the brain can wake up and start functioning as it should have been from the beginning. The risks and limitation are this is the most invasive of all the surgical options. Uh, the scar is visible, although we tend to make the incision usually behind the hairline. So by the time the hair grows back, it's a little bit more manageable. We do have to shave some hair. And the complication list includes infection, staying in the hospital for longer, neurological complications, and a small percentage chance of bleeding in the brain that could cause a stroke, visual impairment, problems with memory, as well as pain for the surgery itself. Next slide. So overall, I just want to bring this about and make everyone on this phone call aware that the risks of epilepsy surgery are real, but the risks are very low and the risks compare very beneficially to just one year of living with uncontrolled epilepsy. And once the patient and the family hears the fact that this risk is manageable and that the team works very hard at decreasing that risk and decreasing the complications, usually that's a very good start to the conversation to be able to control your seizures better. Each person will have different risk profiles. Somebody who's a diabetic will have more difficulty healing their incision where somebody who has high blood pressure will have a slightly higher chance of potential bleeding complications. But all those are manageable and all those can be well prepared for by the surgical team. And the greatest benefit of epilepsy surgery, of course, is the goal of all of us here, is to cut down on the seizures or to have a patient come out of this seizure free. Yet again, when considering epilepsy surgery, it's very important to weigh all the surgical risks as we said, against the risk of continuing to have seizures. Next slide. So at this point, it's a tremendous pleasure of us uh, uh, to be able to introduce you to Matthew. He's one of our patients who has been doing well. And what we'll do is, uh, I guess, Alyssa, if you can flash up the next slide as well. Matthew underwent treatment in our center over the last few years. And um, if we can go ahead and uh, give him the stage to talk about his experience. I know Anu potentially has some questions for him as well. And then we do. Matthew, thank you so much for making the time to be here with hey us. Hey guys, everybody can hear me well? You're good. Perfect. Well, so basically this whole adventure started um, the summer of 2018. And unfortunately I got into a very serious diving accident where I dove headfirst into the shallow end of a pool, hit my head directly on my forehead to the point where the blood was hemorrhaging down into my eyelids. And 
I thought I was fine. You know, two months went by, nothing, no side effects or anything really. And then all of a sudden, you know, one night I just started seizing in the middle of my bathroom to the point where I was, it was so abrupt and crazy that I fell over and knocked the toilet clear off of, of the, uh, the base, you know? And so that also hurt my back and there were other um, things that stem from it. But um, so from that seizure, I went to a, a smaller Long Island community hospital. And I could tell from s walking in there that it wasn't up to standards of, and, and what I'm used to being taken care of. I, uh, I do have to note that my mother works at the Mount Sinai Hospital, so I've been familiar with it and a patient there for several years before for different issues. So immediately that was my first thought, knowing how well and, you know, I, I just was reading in one of the journals that Mount Sinai is the number eight neurological, neurological hospital in the world and number one in New York. So if I had to be anywhere to figure out anything up here, that's where I was going to go. So we transferred like two days after and I was immediately under the care of Dr. Jute and she diagnosed me with epilepsy. And um, from that time forward, we tried several different medications. And as Dr. Singh mentioned earlier, a lot of side effects come with those medications. And so it's not only what you have to deal with epileptic wise with the seizures and the auras and the depression and things, but you stack that on top of what happens with the side effects from the medication all also. So it really was an adjustment. And um, so as Dr. Jate and her PA, Jessica Claro worked with me over the few years, uh, about three years, uh, two years almost, and um, we got to a very good point and where from February, 2019 to February, 2020, I went seizure free and we, we thought we were on the right path. And so I actually got my driver's license back. I was, you know, thinking I was going to get back into the world. And then um, on vacation in California at the end of that month. So I hadn't even had my license back for a full month yet. I became, slightly overwhelmed in a crowd of over a thousand people. And I began to have a focal aura right in the middle of the crowd, which later, which later on led to a full convulsive seizure later on that night. And um, I also suffered a concussion during that seizure because I hit my head straight on a granite tabletop and was knocked out cold on the floor. Um, so from that point on, my my seizures came back in full force um and we were also upping the medication as well and i went from not having a seizure for a year to having them back almost every other day whether it was just a minor focal subclinical seizure or it was a tonic clonic convulsive seizure but they were very common and almost weekly and so we we did boost the medicine up but Dr. Tay finally got to the conclusion that it wasn't helping. And um, that's when I was referred to Dr. Panoff and he explained in great detail what he just explained to all of you. So he made it so that I had my own choice and just into which procedure I you know, wanted. And basically I chose the least invasive seizure um, surgery because I believed that I think that I'm going to the best hospital, might as well try the, you know, I have very minimal scarring on my head and that's the best part, you know, that I, I look normal, you can't tell that I have surgery and it's pretty much been successful. I, since the day of the surgery, I have not even had the slightest aura. I have been phased off of Zoloft and any anti-depression anxiety medicine because not only were they able to remove the part in my brain that was affected by the seizures, but they also, after going through all those detailed MRIs that they referred to before, they found another abnormality in my hippocampus that was swollen and they were able to remove that, which also helped out the anxiety depression as well. So two months after the surgery, 
I was already off of Zoloft and any other anti-anxiety medications I was taking, which is amazing. But now fast forward almost a year since the surgery, um, I'm no longer on any anti-seizure medication and I'm able to drive starting this month again. I just got a full-time job. I'm leading worship at my church again. And you know, the thing is with this, I could say all this, but this time last year, none of this would have been possible. I was a completely different person when this began, you know, and I grew up very extroverted, very out there. I loved playing instruments and being on stage and performing and being in the spotlight. And uh, when this all happened, it was like a 180 degree turn to where I literally couldn't raise my hand in class without feeling nervous and, and you know, embarrassed almost. And that was part of the anxiety. And so now I'm able to speak very cohesively and clearly to you tonight, which could not have happened last year at this point. I'm, like I said, leading worship at my church. I'm playing my bass guitar, piano, making music, things that I haven't done in three years, you know? And it's like, I feel better right now than I did before I was even diagnosed with epilepsy. And, you know, one other thing is you know, every year I have a yearly um, assessment and I just had it uh, about two weeks ago. And everything says that my brain is functioning even better than it was before I had the surgery, above average across the board on, on many different tests that they did testing my memory, cognitive function, so on and so forth. And that was very encouraging to me to see it on paper, not only to feel inside that I feel better, but to actually see the results and the testing results that show that I am doing, you know, a whole lot better. And that's a testament to the work that they did, but it didn't come with, with, with you know, a slight anxiety, but it wasn't until I met Dr. Panoff and he explained everything and he showed me that there's nothing to be worried about basically. And I went into the operating room with no anxiety at all. I, I believe we were even laughing and cracking jokes before I'm getting a six hour brain surgery. And, you know, me personally, that hearing the word brain surgery used to scare me, you know, I, that was the last thing I wanted to do. But I realized I have friends that have been suffering for epilepsy from epilepsy for the past 30, 40 years that are still taking medication every day and they've never even considered surgery. And, you know, this opportunity, this, you know, what many people might think have been ter terrible for me has, has actually been a blessing for a lot of other people because I've been able to show them that you don't have to suffer your whole life. You don't have to take this medication and deal with the side effects and things like that. If you just contact the right person, the right hospital and get the procedure done if you qualify. So, but it also takes a long time of testing and to figure out if that's the right way. So, but that's the best part about Mount Sinai is they don't cut corners. So we did step by step, just like they explained earlier. And on December 15th, I had my laser ablation surgery. And like I said, since that day, I haven't even had an aura, much less any convulsive seizures or anything like that. So, you know, just that fact alone is a testament to the success of the surgery itself. So. It's just, you know, right now, everything's going well, and it's just continues to get better and better. And it stems from that December 15th, December 15th surgery day. So I, I really appreciate the work that you, Dr. Singh, Dr. Gatan, Dr. Jete, and all the rest of the team have put in to me over the past three years. It, it, it's funny because in the hospital, I was approached by people who said, you know, you might not know me, but I've been studying your brain for the past two years, you know, and that was overwhelmingly, it just calmed all anxiety at that point, because I knew that the people that were working on me knew exactly what was in here and exactly what they needed to do to the point where, you know, we did the SEEG, we found out exactly where 
the spot was because as they mentioned before, I have focal epilepsy. So we narrowed it down to exactly where in the brain it was coming from. And then two months later, one, two, three, laser ablation surgery, got it all out. And here I am today, 100% better. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks for sharing your experience. It means a lot to us. And I wish you all the best. Um, I hope you continue to do very well. Uh, you're one of those lucky ones who made it uh, to our comprehensive epilepsy center in time. But you know there are studies which have shown that people suffer for more than two decades before mm -hmm. they can uh, find out whether they are good surgical candidates or not. And patients with drug-resistant epilepsy Though there are about 1 million people in the United States uh, and about, about, I would say, 250,000 people can qualify for some kind of surgery, different kinds that Dr. Panov mentioned, but it is still very underutilized and despite big academic centers in New York City. So thank you. And, you know, I think the concept of the drug-resistant epilepsy is very poorly understood by patients as well as by our own physicians who are not epileptologists and people are not aware of the positive surgical outcomes either. So that's why I think it's very important to have these kind of webinars to educate people what is out available for them. So thank you. Definitely. Absolutely. Thank Matthew. you guys. I mean, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. So no, you did such an amazing job uh, here. Hearing from you just makes us all inspired again and makes us remember how challenging it is to be on the other side. And how I'm looking at some of the names of people who are calling in right now, you know, that they, they would just love to peek behind the curtain and see what it's like to be on the other side, to be seizure free, to have the seizures better controlled. And uh, you're one of those paradigms that we work towards. Mm -hmm. And again, the outcomes are never guaranteed, but we're so happy and you don't have to tell us your neuropsych tests are better. You're a better public speaking than anyone <laughs> on this phone call, including Anna and I, which is such a testament to what you've been able to do. I and that. I think that you stressing the fact that fighting the anxiety of going through a surgical intervention is probably the toughest part of this. Uh, and uh, you telling the folks on the phone call how you were able to do it it's continuous conversations. It's mm -hmm. an open, ongoing discussion about specifically what will happen and why we think it's the best thing for you and for your family. And I think you've just phrased that so eloquently. I, um, I again, I wanna thank everyone and I wanna just address a couple of questions that have popped up. Uh, there's a question from Sarah regarding lost memory from seizures. And if the seizures are minimized, can people regain some of it? Uh, probably not specifically the memories that you were unable to make because of the seizures, but the memory circuits do tend to recover. As you can see with Matthew, it's, it's possible to have and be able to make better memories in the future. Unfortunately, some seizures are severe enough that they will continuously hurt the memory centers. It's very uncommon. The next question is, you know, can, um, can the seizures wipe out your whole memory? Uh, they can definitely worsen it. It's uncommon to completely eradicate someone's memory with seizures, but most certainly getting better control of your epilepsy sooner will make your memory in the long run better than otherwise. And that's the important difference between some of the medications that overall do dampen down how the brain functions versus a much more pointed treatment. And a good way to think of minimally invasive procedures like this is it's almost a medication that is delivered exactly to the right spot. And sometimes that helps people overcome some of the anxiety of knowing that this is still surgery. And we can treat this together in a balance. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, this one says, does this mean you would never be diagnosed at all, even after 10 years? And um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble understanding that question does that mean that uh, the seizures would have never been diagnosed if you if uh, Jen if you could just clarify and maybe retype the question if possible maybe she means to, am I still classified as an epileptic person regardless Understood. of whether or not I have the seizure Understood. yeah we'll go for that one so for example yes if uh, if Matthew goes through the next 10 years as seizure free 
Yes, I see. So that, that's probably what they're, what they're saying. So epilepsy itself can be cured. Uh, there's a definition to epilepsy, and I'll defer to Anu for specifics of that. But if you do not have spontaneous seizures, uh, if you are subjectively seizure-free for a certain amount of time, um, you are cured. And the majority of these cures do come from uh, surgical intervention. If you're on medication, the, the epilepsy is controlled. But you, we most certainly have ways nowadays to cure epilepsy. Some, some patients have a very relapsing, remitting kind of a, you know, course, which makes it a little harder to understand that which population has drug resistance epilepsy. As, as Matthew mentioned, that he was doing well until he had another concussion and then his seizures just went out of control. And, and then there are patients who can go for a few years and then their seizures come back and uh, they're never controlled, whether it's some changes in their medications or without any changes, uh, some kind of a stress, trauma, uh, even, a, even a trivial head trauma can, can worsen their epilepsy. So, uh, you know, it has all different kind of courses. Some people have very mild epilepsy and some people have these remissions and relapses. But if you're drug resistance, the chances that you will become seizure free is really in, um, in, in you know, low digit number, I would say five to seven person. Can you have, you know, epilepsy totally resolved at some point? Yes, I have seen it, but that chance is less than 10 person, I would say. Thank you, Anu. And there's one more question that we wanted to address. Someone brought up the idea that deep brain stimulation can cause depression as a, as a complication, as a side effect of the stimulation. That is specifically related to one of the brain targets that we use in deep brain stimulation for epilepsy, and that's the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. Tiny little spot if you put your finger in the eyeball and in the ear and kind of where they connect, right about that, that spot is where the, the thalamus itself is. In the big trial that happened in the United States in the early 2000s, they did see that some patients had more depressive symptoms. And we think it is because deep brain stimulation continuously stimulates the brain. We think that some of the other ways of stimulation like responsive neuromodulation that waits for a seizure and only then stimulates will cut down on the chances of somebody developing depressive symptoms. But it's a complicated and great question because epilepsy itself will cause a patient to be depressed. And sometimes it's very hard to untangle the two. What we do know is they're connected. And usually if the epilepsy gets better, the depression gets better as well. So guys, we're close to eight o'clock. I wanna thank everyone who is uh, on this phone call. Whoever wants to still hang around and chat more or have more questions, uh, we will be here. Other than that, again, we just wanna thank you so much for spending your, your Tuesday evening with us. We want to thank Matthew and give him a round of applause. Again, a tremendous person, and we're always so happy to have you here and to be able to relate your experience to the other patients. Blessed. I'm blessed to be here, and I can only thank you guys and the team and the Lord. And it's just, it's just great to look back and where I was and to read the story on the website and to look back and see what I've been through and look at my life now and how it's improved exponentially. And it's just... I can't, I, I can't even put it into words sometimes. It's just, it, it, it's, I was, like you said, depressed. I couldn't drive. I had to drop out of school. I had to stop working. I, my whole life got put on hold. And now, you know, I just got a brand new job as an assistant store manager. I'm going back to school to be a EEG technician and to get into, you know, into the field of neurology. And that would have never even been a thought if I didn't have to go through the things that I've went through. So like I said, everything that happened happened for a reason. And I believe right now I'm a better person for it. So. Thank you again. Incredibly inspiring. Thank you, everyone. I'm happy to hang out if anybody has more questions. I'll, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll address yeah. one more. Uh, if the patient has generalized epilepsy, specifically Lennox Gustav, is surgery a possibility? So off the record, because it's not approved by the Food Drug Administration, we have seen trials 
that show that generalized epilepsy can be helped. Historically, it's the type of epilepsy that almost never even makes its way to a comprehensive epilepsy center because it's just considered something that should not be held by surgery. But most certainly there are targets in the brain that we could use to help that kind. Uh, there's great physicians up in Boston that are working very hard on it. And we're starting a trial at Mount Sinai itself. We know it works, but that's, that's different. We need to prove it on a level of a clinical trial. And that's, that's starting over the next year. Most certainly do not give up if you have that kind of seizures and generalized epilepsy. Uh, a lot of people are working very hard on getting the help and the solutions to those questions. Okay, guys, again, thank you, everyone. Matthew, you're great. Thanks thank so much for again, the opportunity, Matthew. guys. Melissa, Dr. Panov, bye-bye. Have a good day. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.